Hey, so we are going to get a graph of this and we're going to do it using calculus techniques. First, we're going to find the asymptotes. Remember that asymptotes come in a few basic flavors. There's horizontal, vertical, and slant or oblique asymptotes. Thankfully, this doesn't have the third kind because those are kind of messy and nasty to find. So we'll look for horizontal and vertical. First of all, you should be able to look at the degrees of the top and the bottom and see that they are the same. These are both second degree functions and that means that they will have a horizontal asymptote and the horizontal asymptote will be equal to the ratio of the lead coefficients between the top and the bottom. <clears throat> so the first asymptote we can note will be horizontal. It will be y equals the ratio of the top lead coefficient to the bottom lead coefficient and those are both one. So the horizontal asymptote is one. It will also have a vertical asymptote and that will be when the bottom is zero, but the top is not. This will be x equals two. Okay, so we've dealt with that question. Find all intervals of increase and decrease. This involves getting the derivative and seeing where it's positive, that means the function is increasing and where it's negative, the function is decreasing. So we need to get the derivative. This will be quotient rule. Y prime equals F prime G minus G prime F. Now to get G prime, I did do a uh, chain rule. Power rule on the outside is two times X minus two multiplied by the derivative of the inside but the derivative of the inside is simply one. So you don't really have to use the chain rule very much. And then divided by g squared is the last part of the quotient rule. x minus two used to be to the second power and now it will be to the fourth power. I'm just going to collect things on the top. This is gonna be two x times x squared minus four x plus four minus two x squared times x minus two over the bottom, which is the same. This is 2x cubed minus 8x squared plus 8x minus 2x cubed plus 4x squared over the very same bottom. And these 2x cubes go away, leaving us with this derivative, which I'll put up here to save for later y prime is going to be negative 8x squared plus 4x squared is negative 4x squared, so those are gone, or rather taken care of, plus 8x over x minus two to the fourth power. The purpose of getting that derivative was to see where it's positive, which means the function is increasing, and where it's negative, which means the function is decreasing. So we're going to look at this derivative now and say, where is it positive and where is it negative? The bottom of this will never be negative because it's to the fourth power. So the bottom will never contribute to the positivity or negativity of the function. Therefore, this will be positive or negative according to when the top is positive or negative. So y prime equals zero, which is how we find when it's, uh, when it's positive or negative because it will always pass through zero on its way from negative to positive or positive to negative. So y prime equals zero when, when what? When negative four x squared plus eight x equals zero. So I'm going to factor out a four x from that because I can, that leaves negative x plus two equals zero. And here we have x equals zero and two as the two solutions. Now, before we get all number line happy, it would be good to compare these numbers to the things that will cause problems on the bottom. <clears throat> so yes, it is true that y prime has a top that is equal to zero um, when x equals two, but the bottom is also equal to zero. So uh, the function, the derivative may switch sign at two, but the, the derivative is not properly equal to zero. So we can actually discount this 
We're going to include it on the number line, but only because it's a critical point, not because the derivative is equal to zero at that point, okay? So let's get a number line rocking for the derivative. We'll have y prime and x. Zero is of interest and two is of interest. The derivative is zero at zero and the derivative doesn't exist at two. Now, I want you to think about the fact that this derivative will be positive or negative according to when its top is positive or negative because the bottom will never be negative. It's always positive, so it never makes any difference to the positivity or negativity. The top is negative 4x plus, negative 4x squared rather, plus 8x. This is an inverted parabola. This means that it will be positive between its zeros and negative outside of its zeros. So this number line is very easy to fill out. It will be positive between those and negative outside of those. Easy, right? So intervals of increasing and decreasing will be that the function is increasing on the interval from zero to two. Always use open intervals for increasing and decreasing. And it is decreasing from negative infinity up to zero. And then again, from two up to infinity. All right, we've answered the first two. Find the local max and min values. Looking at this number line here that we just drew for the derivative, you can see that the function is decreasing and then increasing. So what that means is that this point right here at zero is going to be a minimum because it decreases and then begins to increase once it reaches the zero. That means it's a minimum. At the two, um, well, okay, here's the lazy solution. The lazy solution says that this is a max, but in fact, the function doesn't exist there because if you go back to the original definition, it doesn't actually exist for the value x equals two. So this is not really true. It doesn't have a maximum value at two. Uh, it has a vertical asymptote at two. So yeah, it goes up, up to that vertical asymptote, and then it uh, starts decreasing afterwards. So that's the sort of behavior that you see around the maximum, increasing and then decreasing. But what this does is it increases up to a vertical asymptote and then decreases after that vertical asymptote. There's never a point that it actually reaches as an, a highest point. And so this is not an actual maximum. So find the local max and min values. There's just one. There's just the point where it reaches the local minimum value at zero. And y of zero is equal to just zero. Put it in there and it doesn't matter what the bottom is because that's zero squared. There is no max. Okay, find the intervals of concavity and inflection points because we've done that. Concavity and inflection points depend on the second derivative. So now, just like we found the first derivative, we are going to find the second derivative. And here, let's clean that up a little and get the second derivative. So y double prime is, this is quotient rule again. F prime will be negative eight x plus eight, that quantity times g, x minus two to the fourth power, minus uh, g prime, which is four times x minus two to the third power, times f, negative four x squared plus eight x. And then that whole thing over x minus two used to be to the fourth, you square it, and now it's to the eighth. The bottom, not very nice, but keep in mind that just like before, it will always be positive because it's to an even power. We do have to, oh boy. Well, okay, we have to expand the top, but we're going to expand the top so as to find out where it's positive and negative. So really we would be expanding it, collecting, and then trying to factor, but we already have like a super big advantage with the factoring because we've got x minus two 
showing up in two places in, in powers that only differ by one. So in fact, what I'm going to do is not bother with expanding, doing like terms and then collecting and then factoring. I'm just gonna factor it now. So I'm going to take out um, x minus two to the third power. And what will be left over is, let me see, I think some square brackets are called for here. It would leave negative eight x plus eight times x minus two to the first power, and then minus four times negative four x squared plus eight x. Close all the brackets. And then that's divided by x minus two to the eighth power. And yeah, sure, I, I am gonna collect the inside there because you know I can't quite see where it's gonna be positive and negative yet. So it'll be x minus two to the third times negative eight x squared, negative eight x squared uh, plus 16 x plus eight x minus 16. And then I'll do this set of multiplications. So negative four times negative four x squared is plus 16 x squared. And then negative four times eight x is minus 32 x. that whole thing divided by x minus two to the eighth. And doing one final cleanup, I've got y double prime equals x minus two to the third times, so this and this, 16x squared minus 8x squared is 8x squared. So those have been taken care of. And then 16x plus 8x is 24x minus 32x is negative 8x. Oh, please have all eights. That would be so cool. And then minus, yes, minus 16. Good, excellent, over x minus 2 to the eighth power. An 8 can factor out of that. So we finally, I'm getting close to the final version, so I'll put it over here. Uh, this is going to be 8 times x minus 2 to the third power times x squared minus x minus 2, all over x minus 2 to the eighth power. Now I'll clean up all this in between work. And the reason I wanted this second derivative was so that I could see when it would be positive and when it would be negative. Uh, the function will respond only to its top in terms of positivity and negativity because the bottom is to an even power. So it will be zero. Again, zero is the boundary between positive and negative values. This will be equal to zero when eight times x minus two to the third power times x squared minus x minus two equals zero. Now this has, that's kind of a curly zero. This has an easy answer that's trickily false. And then it has another couple of answers that are actually going to be useful. This will obviously be true when x is two from this factor right here, x minus two to the third power, because if x is two, then that's zero and that makes the whole thing zero. But we can't put in two, we cannot put in two because it is outside the domain of the original function and the second derivative also fails to exist at that value. So this has a solution of x equals two, but it's fake, it, it's not real. So really we're looking at just x squared minus x minus two equals zero. And let me see, um, this, does this factor? I think it does. This is gonna be x and x. We've got a minus two and a plus one and we're good. So this gives us, and here we have another two trying to sneak its way in through the back door, but no, 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 we're smart. So we're not gonna let it. So x equals two is an answer. No, it's not because that's outside the domain. So this 
is extraneous or whatever insulting word you want to apply to it, x equals negative one is the only legitimate time that the second derivative um, changes, uh, th that is equal to zero. It may change sign at negative one. So we should investigate that. So now we'll get a number line rocking for y double prime. We want to look at negative one and also at two. We know that the, deri the second derivative is zero at negative one, and we know that it doesn't exist at two. Between and outside, we need to analyze that. So between, um, this isn't the same kind of simple polynomial as the other one where we can say, you know, oh, it's a parabola. It's you know negative between and positive outside. So we have to actually use some sample numbers, which kind of sucks, but okay. So in between negative one and two is zero. That's a nice easy one. Let's use that as a sample. So y double prime of zero, what's that equal to? Well, it's eight times uh, a negative number times zero minus zero minus two. So this is positive, that's the, the eight times negative, that's the x minus two cubed, and then times another negative, that's from this. And that means that the top is positive and the bottom is always positive. So this is going to be positive. That means this in between gets labeled as positive. Now let's look at what happens on the left-hand side. So if we put in like a large negative number, say like, you know, negative 10 or something like that, then um, eight times, oh, I'm getting a little messy here. Y double prime of zero, I'm just gonna get rid of that. So eight times negative 12 to the third power times, uh, let's see, so negative 10 squared is uh, 100 minus X minus two, so that's going to be positive. So you have positive times negative times positive, which means that it's negative. So on the left-hand side, it's going to be negative. Don't trust in symmetry. Sometimes it happens that uh, you have plus, mi uh, sorry, minus, then plus, and then another plus. So don't assume that it's going to switch again. Sometimes happens, not always. So at two, <clears throat> Uh, sorry, after two. So say that we put in a large positive number like 10. We would have eight times 10 minus two. Um, 10 minus two is eight cubed that, that's positive. That's all we care about. And then 10 squared minus X minus two, that's 10 squared minus 10 minus two, that's times positive again. So uh, we do have negative times positive, I'm sorry, um, positive, times positive times positive, which means that, yeah, actually it is still positive after that. And th that's because there's a root both here and here at two. So it ends up being a repeated root that's repeated four times, which means that the function doesn't change sign there. So yes, we do have a plus right here. Okay, so this gives us the intervals of concavity and it also gives us the inflection points. There's an inflection point right here and the intervals of concavity are based on the second derivative. So I don't really need the second derivative anymore because I got what I wanted from it. So I'm gonna erase it just for room. And I'll say inflection point at um, X equals negative one And I'll get the y as well, just because it's easy. So uh, that'll be one over negative one minus two squared. One over negative one minus two is negative three. Square that is nine. So it's an inflection point at negative one comma one ninth. And then it's concave up on the intervals from negative one to two and also from two to infinity. And it's like, oh, well, why can't we just say negative one to infinity? The reason is that that includes the value of two, which is not in the domain of the function. So if the function is, uh, if the function fails to exist at two, it can't 
be concave up or concave down. It doesn't exist there. Concave down, <clears throat> that's going to be on the rest of the intervals. So from negative infinity up to negative one. All right, so what is this graph going to look like? First, I'll put in the horizontal asymptote. That'll be at one. Local max and min values. Um, I have that there's a minimum at zero comma zero. So that'll be right here at the origin. <clears throat> there are no max values, that's a min. And uh, it's increasing, where is it increasing? From zero to two only, and then decreasing everywhere else. So, ah, so far it seems like this might have this sort of behavior. So decreasing all the way up until this, then increasing from zero to two, and then decreasing from two to infinity. Your class may have taught you that the existence of a horizontal asymptote means that the function can't cross the asymptote. That's not actually true. The definition of a horizontal asymptote is that it is the limit at infinity. There's nothing in the definition of a horizontal asymptote that says that it can't touch the asymptote. No, that's not true. It just means that the function becomes arbitrarily close to the asymptote as x approaches either positive or negative infinity. So this seems like it's, you know, kind of suggested to be the general shape of the graph. Um, let's see, though. It doesn't have a max value. Ah, can you see what's going to happen? Can you see what's going to happen? So here, I drew it without the vertical asymptote. That was a mistake on my part. And if you were yelling at me, then you should have been, because I was doing it wrong. So decreasing, um, let's see. Ah, it's increasing up until there, and then decreasing from here onwards. Oops. Uh, it needs to decrease towards the um, towards the horizontal asymptote, so like this. Okay, I've got the picture just based on the increasing and decreasing. I'm going to go in and look at the second derivative and see if maybe it needs to be fine-tuned a little bit, okay? So concave down from negative infinity up to negative one. That means that there's an inflection point at negative one comma one ninth. Well, that looks like somewhere around here. So around here, the function stops looking like an overturned bowl and starts looking like an upward bowl. So yeah, this is actually legitimate. It, it, it could actually do this. And now we need to make it concave up everywhere else. So concave up from negative one to two, yeah. Yeah, that's what this is. This is concave up because the first derivative is increasing. The lines are becoming more positively sloped. And concave up from two to infinity, yes, that's also what this is. So you can compare for yourself. This is exactly what you would get. Like this sort of picture is what you would get if you put it into a graphing calculator. But if you want to be able to get these graphs by hand, you can actually do it as long as you use calculus to carefully locate all of these features.